here we go again. Uh, the program announcement over the music might need explanation what dull, dullest means. That refers back to the 50s. We had a secretary, state secretary called Dulles, and his brother was um, Dulles also. He was in charge of CIA in those days. And uh, we didn't like him very much. We told them the very dull. Um, and this was, uh, of course, Eisenhower's regime. I'm rolling back 50 years. Cinema was 50 years old when I came to the United States. Uh, only six years ago, we celebrated 100th, 100th anniversary of cinema. It's almost fits into one's lifetime, the entire history of cinema. Everything significant at that time, 50 years from the beginning, anything significant in cinema has been achieved already. The history of cinema has been written. D.W. Griffith, Chaplin, Keaton, Rossellini, von Stroheim, Eisenstein, Vigo, Renoir, Maeder, etc., etc. Not only the history of cinema, but also the history of American literature was written at that time. Faulkner, Dreiser, Hemingway, Dos Passos, Arthur Miller, Ezra Pound, Witten, Sandberg. What else we had than 50 years ago? Men wore very wide trousers with cuffs at the end, and uh, women wore extremely wide skirts and very, very red lipstick. Kissing sometimes was a problem, <laughs> um, because a problem both ways. It, it lipstick gets somehow transmitted back and forth, and then a woman very fast has to do it again. And uh, uh, There were no supermarkets and no shopping malls. And uh, when I came to the States, the ration cards were just sort of disappearing. Perhaps you didn't know that during, during World War II, many items like butter and milk and gas was rationed in this country, many, many items. You could buy, you, could, you had to carry a little booklet with clip on, little clipping areas where they punch out or cut it out. Only that much you can buy a month or a week, depending on the product. That was disappearing when I came in to this country. Also, there was no independent cinema, only Hollywood. But we had, this is unstable. <laughs> we had Francis, uh, Connie Francis, Fabian, Frankie Avalon. This is going to be on your midterm test to recognize these names, knowing that every one of these names was bigger than five Madonnas put together. That was the music world. Also, we had Senator Joseph McCarthy. And if you, you are quiet and listen well, you'll hear him still screaming down there in hell. <laughs> he will do that for the rest of his eternity. If you don't know who Joseph, Senator Joseph McCarthy was, better find out. You might get another one and uh, Governor Giuliani or, or somebody else's coat. Also, we had censorship. Yes, political and um, religious censorship. 
uh, we had perhaps the most severe censorship that not even hundreds of ayatollahs would invent censorship we had here. Hayes office in Hollywood approved all scripts and the uh, finished films. Anything they didn't like, it had to be cut out. Without their okay, uh, no film could have been exhibited publicly any place in this country. They were concerned mostly with uh, nudity, but I don't mean frontal nudity, mostly how much of a woman's top could be exposed on screen and how long a kiss could last on the screen, three seconds. That was the limit of permitted kissing and uh, had to be properly done. Uh, and each state, I'm very familiar with New York State, had a censorship that it, any film required their approval for public exhibition. The censorship was called Board of Regents. They screened all the movies and uh, ordered certain scenes to be cut. And it was cut. That's why recently we have been seeing all these what's known director's cut, uh, uh, original version. That means that uh, it includes scenes that were eliminated by various censors. Then was uh, the, the funniest censorship called uh, Legion of Decency. This was a old people's club organized by the Catholic Church and they uh, reviewed films after Hayes office, the state office, uh, regions of uh, Board of Regents censored. They still continued censoring additionally from um, religious point of view, perhaps some opinions were not right for the Catholic Church. And um, uh, the Catholic Church, the bishops used to, publish, used to publish a list of films forbidden for Catholics to be seen. They had no right to cut anything, but they would forbid believers to see these films. If they see, of course, they will go to hell. So a good Catholic would never see films which were on the list. This list used to be read every Sunday from the pulpit in all the parishes. And this list was maintained until 1965. Uh, this multitude of censors, uh, they were concerned with how much a woman's stop can be exposed, but also with words. Uh, today you grew up with F's and all that, so you don't realize that not even shit was permitted in those days. And there was a case there. Uh, uh, of course, uh, there were movies, the way you, you see Hollywood movies, there were movies made in Hoboken. You used to call them stag movies, which were either below or above the censorship. Those were the first underground movies, perhaps. Uh, uh, also, they had no glossy nude magazines of either sex, no porno stars. They became visible late in the 60s, early 70s, uh, when the censorship was defeated by Shirley Clark, New York filmmaker, who produced the stage play The, the Connection. She filmed the connection, and the word shit was used as a substitute for various drugs, and was used many, many times in the film, and the film was condemned. So she fought with a great, great attorney who volunteered his services for nothing, uh, all the way to the Supreme Court, and censorship was eliminated, and uh, 65 by Shirley Clark, the filmmaker. Filmmaker, fantastic filmmaker, good fighter. Um, uh, and after that, not only shit could be used on screen, but pornography exploded. 
42nd Street, cinema after cinema showed only porno movies. Porno stars became celebrities. They were big. They were being interviewed on radio and television. Uh, pornography, uh, I was not aware of pornography until perhaps I was 35 years old because um, I do come from a strange, primitive culture where we didn't have in our native language words for all those F words you have. There were some, but they were imported from Germany normally. Uh, because we didn't have in our native language a word for many parts of our body or for certain acts of ourselves. We didn't have those words. I really don't know how we communicated, but we did. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, some things are communicated much better without words. Oh. This is... Um, the m beginning in mid-50s I'm talking about now. The beat generation was just beginning to learn how to write. Uh, when people think about the beat generation, they always think about writers and poets of those days. But there were beat painters, dancers, and filmmakers. Uh, two years ago, uh, in Italy, Venezia, Venezia, Biennale di Venezia organized the, the 50 years of the beat generation to celebrate the output in all forms of art. And um, I was honored to open the f exhibition, the festival that lasted a month with my film, Hallelujah the Hills. I didn't know that was considered beat film, but apparently they thought it was a beat film. So I was very, very happy. Uh, after I came to the United States, uh, the first $10 we, myself and my brother, saved, we, brought, we bought a admissions ticket uh, year ticket to Museum of Modern Art film screenings. Uh, we could not afford two tickets, so what we did was one would walk in and the other one would hang around behind the ropes and uh, pass the ticket. So another one would walk in. After weeks and months, uh, the guards, or the, what I call them guards, that were checking the, these things at the entrance, they recognized us and they would say, to come on, don't play this game, just go away. <laughs> yeah, so we used to just walk in with one ticket. Uh, uh, we watched movies whenever we could, it seemed day and night, at the Museum of Modern Art. And uh, we used to call them Mama, it's still being known as Mama. This was our Mama <laughs> of cinema. Uh, even today, she is still our mama for new generations to experience, learn the history of cinema. At that time, it was not only mama. Uh, there were great other places that showed films, not contemporary films, but the revival films from all over the world. Fifth Avenue Cinema showed only French revival movies. Thalia. A year-long festival, double features. These are always double features. Year-long festival of all foreign films. It means two films a day. You end up with seeing over 700 movies a year. And all those film clubs we had, Theodore Hub Film Society, Cinema 16. I had my own film forum, but it went belly up in about yeah, less than two, two years. We had no money. Laugh-In on 42nd Street showed only shorts, comedy shorts. Stanley Cinema showed only Russian movies. And all these showcases, of course, are gone except uh, Dear Mama. The, there was 
one film book published a year. If you have gone and seen the shelves of books and um, any books, large bookstore in New York, you'll see perhaps a thousand books published a year. Everything is being published now. Uh, at that time, the, the entire film library could be carried under one arm, perhaps. They had no books. There were only one magazine, film magazine, in the United States, one in England, one in France, and one in Russia. And there were no film schools, no film departments at colleges and universities. Movies, as we understood, were made in Hollywood, had no business in academia. We call them movies now, of course, we call them films. There were no colleges giving courses called Experimental Film 101. <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> like having a course in literature saying Creative Writing 101 or Creative Painting 101. <clears throat> what the hell is that? Art making cannot be taught in school because art is a revolution. No amount of grant money will ever produce art. I'll talk about that next week. In those good days past, there were no MA or MFA or PhDs in film. Today, if you listen carefully, you'll hear cameras grinding everywhere and those blinking lights in front of video cameras. Hans Richter, the granddaddy of Dada, avant-garde cinema, he was guilty of starting the first film school at CCNY in New York City. That's redundant. CCNY means City College of New York City. Um, he had a house in Connecticut. We would visit him, and uh, he had a pond, and uh, being Dada, he would fish. I think there were catfish in his pond, and to impress or just to, to be uh, Dada, he would grab them by hand. He would just grab out of the water and by their heads up and throw them back into the pond. <laughs> and uh, no comments made. Nobody said anything. And <laughs> was taken just as normal to do. We would play chess outside and uh, after chess we would drink wine and uh, talk about films. The talk was not the way you talk about films, this or that and the good, bad, no. Our film talk was film talk. Where to get cheap stock, where to get equipment for nothing, that was real film talk for us. None of this phony, pseudo-intellectual. <laughs> we didn't speak of aesthetics, except at one time. We referred to, Hans Richter mentioned an article written about uh, uh, Man Ray's film, Emak Baki, I don't know how to pronounce it, it's a Basque word for a title, and nobody knows how to pronounce it. Yeah. The article was very profound. It explained why there were five or six shots of this thing and why three shots of that thing in the film. And Ray said all he wanted to do was to film some of his ready-made objects from different angles to see how it looks on film. And he used what he referred to as Chinese editing method. He would cut up all those shots, put them in a paper bag, shake it up, take one by one, and splice them in the order they came out. And then there were articles written of this profound theory, profound depth in editing this film. <laughs> that was the only time we spoke about the aesthetics of cinema. And then he made a film that ran for about eight minutes, all you would see 
a journal on the screen. He was making fun of uh, uh, Jacques Braque, who always used uh, in his paintings words, journal, someplace on the table. So uh, Mandray said, all right, I'll film this word, and let's see how long people will watch before they walk out of, this, of the theater. And uh, that was the whole intention. Now they see, uh, they're writing PhD papers about it. Yeah. You have to remember that in those days, um, these were artists of the original Dada movement. Uh, and their sense of fun and life was very acute and uh, whose respect for art was zero. What Dadaists did to annoy us or to have fun for themselves only, today are studied as masterpieces and uh, art, film art history classes, even at Bard. And all those Dada artists are rolling on green grass, <coughs> laughing their heads off. <laughs> Look what happens. Five years in the States, myself and my brother Jonas, we started something, the consequences of which we did not anticipate at that time. We published the first issue of Film Culture magazine. Uh, with that, I think we unleashed a monster out of our control. Within years, the film culture became the spokesman for the new American cinema in the States. And the, we became the focusing glass for the new world of cinema. Also, it became a clearinghouse for European filmmakers passing through New York. We became guides and chaperones for filmmakers like Fellini, Antignoni, Rossellini, Buñuel, Truffaut, etc. We were writers, poets, painters. We were all involved in all forms of art. In 1954, there was no such a word as filmmaker. We considered ourselves as cineasts, lovers of cinema. The word filmmaker came in much, much later when people started to apply for grants to make films. We were young and very inexperienced and very, very different from each other. But one thing united us. We were unhappy with the cultural and art scene around us. When I say we were unhappy with the state of art scene, we were unhappy about cinema, architecture, poetry, literature, music, you name it. We were angry. We wanted to cut down everything. We wanted to pull everything out with, it, with their roots and start fresh. No more rules, no rules, no rules whatsoever. No idols, no gods, because art has no rules. Art has no gods. We are for the revolution. We started to write manifestos. As long as we admire the past, we are not free. We are still tied down. We are still tied down by the rules of the past. We cannot fly. These words are part of our statements in public and press. We said, let's turn our backs on everything, on everything that has been done till now. Our battle cry was, personal art, strip yourself naked. No more institutional art, no more academia. Damn with critics. We call them crickets. And to hell with all the museums. Museums are only for art which is dead already. It's not living. I'm going to do it my way, the way I want it. I don't care if you like it or you don't. I'm doing it. New liter literature was being written, new dance, new music, new cinema. Everything was fresh and exciting. That was end of 50s beginning of 60s. That time means to me, simply, in few words, 
no more rules. Do whatever you want as long as it is pleasing to the eye, to the heart or ear. Abandon all the prescribed rules. New songs were being written, songs that didn't rhyme anymore. Poetry didn't rhyme anymore. And novels didn't have it to have a story. All this was unheard before. All these molds of the past were broken and uh, nobody knew how to judge the new. Now each artist was on one's own, following one's own heart. No one could be able to tell or compare one to each other, young to the old, nothing fit anymore. We said, we are the new generation, generation without rules, and after a couple of years, Madison Avenue called us our generation, the beat generation. They had no business to interfere with us. They ruined us. People came out of woodwork. People like Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, Gregory Corso, Leroy Jones, known as Baraka today, Robert Frank, Larry Rivers, Andy Warhol, Yoko Ono, Stan Brakic, Lucia Tuglashevsky, John Cage, Merce Cunningham, Eric Hawkins, and at the end, Mecca's brothers. Everybody, especially in New York, was there together to start something new, and where it will go, they didn't know themselves. A new f form of art emerged happening Capra and others, and today it degenerated in academic institutions as installation or installation art. Today you have to add art to everything to get grant money. Installation art, visual arts, video art, film art, bullshit art. And of course, out of all this, the fluxus grew out. The most glorious new neo-dada of our generation was Fluxus. And film culture was always in the vanguard at that time. Still the focusing point in New York. As I said, at that time, people were not in villages yet. They are not separated into villages. We are painters, we are poets, we are that. We are still all together. Because we don't know what the hell we are doing. Those who were made films, they danced. Those who danced made sculpture. Poets didn't do anything. We around film culture felt confident enough, strong enough in our conviction to call for a total war, a holy war. In 61, we called a meeting in New York of the intellectuals and issued a manifesto. We called for new cinema, for cinema the color of blood. The assembled people signed the manifesto. Other people later signed from distance by mail. It was a formidable group of over 50 people who signed. I'll read a few names. You'll recognize uh, what was happening. People who signed, Allen Ginsberg, some of you might not recognize because they represent all five or six fields of art. 
Allen Ginsberg, Maisel's brothers, Don Pennybaker, Michelangelo Antonioni, Roberto Rossellini, Francois Truffaut, Jean-Luc Godard, Federico Fellini, Alain René, Peter Brooks, Peter Bogdanovich, <coughs> Norman Mailer, Anna Yin, uh, Arthur Miller, Carl Dreyer, Theodore Dreyer, Elia Kazan, John Casavides, myself, and my brother Jonas. It's a long list. This is sort of pull out. Now I'll read uh, a brief excerpt from the manifesto. Anybody who wants an extensive manifesto, please see me afterwards. I have copies in my office upstairs. This is uh, called the first, manif manif uh, first statement of the new American cinema. The official cinema all over the world is running out of breath. It is morally corrupt, aesthetically obsolete, thematically superficial, temperamentally boring. Even the seemingly worthwhile films, those that lay claim to high moral and aesthetic standards and have been accepted as such by critics and the public alike, reveal the decay of the product film. The very slickness of their execution has become a perversion covering the, the falsity of their themes, their lack of sensitivity, their lack of style. And if the new American cinema has until now been an unconscious and sporadic manifestation, we feel the time has come to join together. We are many of us. The movement is reaching significant proportions, and we know, that, and we know what needs to be destroyed and what we stand for. As in the other arts in America today, painting, poetry, sculpture, theater, where fresh winds have been blowing for the past couple of years, our rebellion against the old official corrupt and pretentious is primarily an ethical one. We are not an aesthetic school that constricts the filmmaker within a set of dead principles. We believe that cinema is a personal expression we therefore reject interference of producers, distributors, and investors. We reject censorship. We are for art, but not at the expense of life. We don't want false, polished, slick films. We prefer that. We, we prefer them rough, unpolished, but alive. We don't want rosy films. We want them the color of blood. And we all signed up. It's, it's always good to, ha to have these sort of revolutions, manifestos. People thrive on manifestos. After, I don't know, in about five long years, I say long because it's the production, the output of films was fantastic in those first beginning five years of New American cinema. I think the whole face of the cinema changed. Huntall, Madison Avenue betrayed us. They called our films underground. Police raided our screenings. Films were seized. Many of us ended up in jail. But that's the story of the team of the next week's session, the underground cinema. Um, let me change horses for a while. Uh, I was asked by a couple of people uh, why I'm showing certain films or why I'm playing certain music. And they wanted to have my opinion about films I'm showing. Many of the films that I show, I knew the filmmakers, and once you know a filmmaker, director, you cannot be critical. You have to like it or don't like it, but if you like it, your friends are friends, so you have to like it. Except uh, Roman Polanski. And in my long adventurous life, I had met many film directors, including Roman Polanski. He still thinks that we are friends. 
ever since we tried to burn a hotel in Montreal at one time. But we are not friends. I refuse to watch his movies, and I don't care that he's exiled. You know he's exiled. He cannot return to the United States because he raped two 15-year-old girls. Uh, uh, I don't, I think he deserves anything he gets. But my dislike of him has nothing to do with him. In 63 or 64, let's say by that time, it was the first New York Film Festival opening. My film was invited, and also Polanski's film, Knife. Water in the a knife in the water, I think the title. Uh, my film made a big splash <coughs> in Cannes, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> let me get the frog out. <coughs> and other European festivals, and uh, Time Magazine got very excited, and uh, they decided to put. <clears throat> it's still from my film on the, on the cover. Uh, I got the proofs of it. It looked very nice. And <clears throat> there was a story about it. But um, I didn't have a press agent. My producer, who was very inexperienced at that time, <clears throat> didn't know what he was doing. But Polanski had a very, very sharp woman, woman who was um, the press agent. And she convinced, after the cover was already made up, she convinced Time Magazine to have a still from Knife in the Water instead of my still. And it so happened. His st still appeared on Life Magazine. And I have the only proof, the, the press proof, which I still have with me, that my c picture was supposed to be there. So that's why I hate him. <laughs> All right. In 1956, uh, Fellini came to New York for the opening of uh, his film, La Strada. And naturally, we chaperoned him through the streets and showed him uh, the sights at night. Uh, we took him to uh, the Wall Street uh, area, three or four in the morning, emptiness, those canyons of skyscrapers we are walking. We, we come to this huge building, a federal, uh, United States Federal Bank, I think it's called. It's massive, stone, marble, and doors were as high as St. Peter's Cathedral uh, in Rome, 20 feet high, bronze doors. And Fellini sort of, wow, this is where the money is. He leaned on the door, and the door opened. Alarm, bells ringing, and within seconds, we are surrounded with guns, pushed into the corner, and uh, it looked bad. Fellini <laughs> barely spoke English. Uh, and uh, I spoke with very bad accent. And my brother had even worse accent. And another friend, uh, he, he had no accent, but he was born in Cuba. He was Cubano. <laughs> it didn't look for us, and I had a beard. And I thought, this is it. They're, they're going to shoot us right there on the spot. And Fanini was still joking. He said, ask for money, for money to make films. <laughs> and we kept saying, uh, director Fellini, La Strada. Uh, film had just opened a week ago, <coughs> and <coughs> we didn't get any far, uh, any, any far farther than that. And then, but one guard said, <coughs> "I saw the film. If you are the director, whistle the tune from the film." I said, "Oh gosh!" <laughs> and, and sure enough, Fellini whistled the tune. And so it happened. Short story is that they understood that this was accident. That the, Accident, they forgot to lock the door. It was their mistake. So they didn't want, they're not going to report this in the <laughs> uh, diary there. So they gave us a tour, a brief tour of the initial area there, where rooms and rooms full of money stacked, stacked high with money. It's very impressive. 
So we said goodbye and thank you very much. And uh, uh, about 10 years later, when we were shooting our first film, Guns of the Trees, actually through that contact, the guard who has seen La Strada, he arranged for us to use their corridors for filming. Weird, strange world. Uh, so we are going to see La Strada by Fellini. This is an early Fellini. Uh, it is still rooted in the neo-realist tradition. Fellini, before he started making all those operatic films, what we refer to as big, big grandiose in memory, uh, most of the actors, not actors, the number of actors you recognized were they, they were English or Americans. And it, everybody's dubbed into Italian, naturally. The film is subtitled. I couldn't get a very, very good print, but this is the only print that's available in the fields. Hopefully it will come out in DVD, but it's not yet. So suffer a little bit with it, but once you initial, your initial sort of shock that this is not a very good print goes away, go with the story. All right, Ivan, I'll shut it off now. <laughs> 